today. Um, well, thank you again for, for another of these Solanasis seminars online, this Friday. And today I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, to Leandro Lacerda Chacomin, who is from Brazil. Um, just as a background, he completed a master a PhD in botany at the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais. And also researcher, uh, he was researching um, as a visitor at the University of Utah as part of his PhD working with Lynn Boss. And currently he's an adjunct professor at the University of Federal do Oeste do Pará in Santarén, Brazil, where he is part of a biodiversity graduate course that he helped creating and act also as a visa curator and data manager of HSTM Herbarium. Um, Leandro is also a permanent professor at the Botany Graduate Course at the Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas da Amazonia. And sorry, I wasn't thinking of a couple more people. And uh, he has a um, very broad experience in botany with emphasis in plant systematics and taxonomy. His main research interests are uh, phylogenomics, evolutionary biogeography, and taxonomy of flowering plants, with, of course, special attention to the Solanaceae family. And he's also interested in floristics, floristics and long term monitoring of the Amazonian, Amazonian flora. He, he also is uh, very interested in outreach initiatives and scientific literacy and disclosure. Um, so today he's going to talk about Solanaceae systematics and taxonomy and the Amazon. What do they have in common? Um, with that, I um, invite you, Leandro, to share your screen. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Rocio. Um, I hope you all hear me. Okay, um, in advance, I'll um, uh, say sorry because my internet connection in here is really poor so it might fall at some point that's quite normal in here and it's just raining right now so that's a possibility so just to let you know okay but i'll start sharing my screen and um i see here Okay, we can see your screen. That's perfect. See it? Okay, great. Um, wait a minute. Okay. So, um, uh, before I start, I would like to give you a background of why I chose this subject. Um, when I received uh, Rocio's invitation to give this talk, I asked her what should I speak about because um, I currently, I'm not actually uh, spending a lot of time in Solanaceae. I'm actually spending more time in permanent plots and uh, tree monitoring in several ways. But I still have some initiatives that are related to this monitoring, to this long-term monitoring. And uh, the glue between all the things that I've been doing is uh, basically human resources training. So I decided to give you a broad, uh, broader picture of what I've been doing in here and how I have been using Solanaceae as a model um, to human resources training in several levels and how this is important uh, to the state of the art of botanical knowledge in Amazonia and uh, how can this contribute to, the, to where we are and to where we uh, want to get to. So uh, in this, first slide here, you can see some amazing species that we have here in the region. Um, here in the left, I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, my pointer, but here in the left, we have Marquia longiflora. Uh, up here in the middle, we have Solan flesh tendaliano, which is a super common species. Here in the middle, we have a new species of Bufelsia. And with the red fruit, this is Lysiantes glandulosa. And down here, a uh, member of the psychomandra clade of Solanum with its beautiful connectives. And all these species that you see in here, they actually occur in these environments that uh, they are behind. So they are somehow associated with this um, 
envir environmental connections and uh, uh, conditions. And this is one of the things we are interested in here in my lab. Okay, so uh, everything I'm gonna present in this uh, talk today is part of a collaboration with several people, mainly students, but also people that are uh, here in the audience. So in advance, I would like to thank you uh, very much for your cooperation during these uh, past years. Okay. Okay, so uh, to start, I would like to say that since I was young and during my early career stage, I always had this dream of working in the Amazon. The Amazon always captured my attention. And uh, for me as a Brazilian, one of the reasons uh, is that it is half of Brazil, right? It's super uh, considerable in uh, size. So it's a, a continental scale. And it has several situations uh, that as a botanist, I was captured and wanted to spend some time in here. So um, the first situation that uh, is remarkable is the pungency of the forest. So whenever you go in here and you see a forest with a high canopy like this, so this upper image in here is at Floresta Nacional do Tapajós, and uh, the mean um, height of the canopy is like 50 meters. And it's common to see trees like this that you see in this picture above where I'm standing by and trying to measure it. It's not a one uh, man's deal to measure the diameter of a tree like that, right? You need more person, you need more people to do that. Uh, but also since the nineties, when I started reading about um, plant biodiversity in the Amazon, uh, there are several um, biases that is uh, described and some of them still remain. So this is an example here in this map of the Brazilian Amazon that is shown in the right, which is, uh, was published in, in the 90s by Bruce Nelson and some of his collaborators in nature. And this is, uh, he used uh, the genus Zynga as a, a proxy to try to estimate uh, botanical knowledge gaps in the Amazon. In, and one of the conclusions that he got is that the collections were really biased, uh, mainly uh, close to the research centers, right? So here in the middle of the map, you can see a super dark um, uh, spot, which represents Manaus. And here um, in the right a bit, it's Belém, the two main cities in the Brazilian Amazon. And in the middle, you have uh, some private initiatives like a mining company that invested a lot in uh, collecting and um, representing the local flora. And this uh, smaller one in here represents Santarém that is basically a place where Richard Spruce stayed uh, for long and most of the collections that are in here are actually from um, old naturalists. Okay, uh, coming from the 90s to 2007, uh, when this uh, new paper was published by Mike Hopkins uh, and he broadened a bit uh, the groups that he sampled, right? So here we see some figures with uh, specimens density like Bignoni, Chrysobalanaceae, Ingi, and Sapotaceae, which are important groups for the biome. And uh, what we can see like something 15 years later is that the specimens uh, are still concentrated in the same regions and the gaps are kind of the same independently of the group, right? So in the same work, uh, Mike tried to model uh, which places should we tackle to diminish this uh, botanical knowledge gaps. And you see that they are in a darker in the letter D that I presented here in the right, right? And it's basically the Tapajós and uh, Xingu Interflu and uh, the upper um, Rio Negro, which is the upper Amazon basin, right? So this is, these are really remote regions that are not easy to access and they have been um, fully known for centuries now, right? So if you see this, let's mark the spots we have here, the lack of knowledge. Uh, some 10 years later in 2014, another inventory of uh, poorly sampled areas in Brazil was carried out based on databases and um, available data through Beria. And when we come to the Amazon, well, the first picture we have is that um, 
the specimens available uh, in the Amazon and in the rest of Brazil, it's very discrepant. So we have uh, way less specimens in the Amazon and they are concentrated in, in few uh, sites. And after, 10 years after uh, the work of Hopkins, um, you can see that the poorly known areas remain kind of the same. So we know where we have to tackle to diminish these knowledge gaps, but uh, tackling them is it's really hard. So the situation really don't change in a, a long term. So if you see the arrows here again, we are at the same places here, the Tapajós and the Xingu inner flu, and here the Upper Rio Negro and Upper Solimões. And um, another thing that we have to consider when we see this picture of uh, huge knowledge gaps in a super huge area, and sometimes the concept of the Amazon changes depend, depending on the authors, right? Some authors just consider the basin or the lowlands as uh, a proper uh, sense that should be used. But most of the, actor, the authors also consider the Guyanas. Uh, independently of the concept, uh, the situation of deforestation, it's uh, rapidly uh, advancing. And it is advancing through an arch that we see here in the Southeast, uh, mainly in Brazil, right? Because is where we have uh, uh, larger um, cities and uh, agriculture uh, limits uh, growing into the forest, okay? And uh, if you see the past two slides and take a look at this one with this deforestation map that dates from 2017, we can see that uh, the deforestation frontier, as we call it, is rapidly advancing in one of the huge uh, sites that we have a, a gap of knowledge, which is the uh, Tapajós and Xingu Interflu. Okay. Okay. So let's discuss a bit why uh, the Amazon have these huge uh, gaps of knowledge and why they stay for so long uh, unresolved. Right. Let's use an example of this site that you see here in the right, which is the village of Alter de Chão, a place that I lived for six six years. I just moved from there uh, last year, and uh, this. Uh, freshwater uh, beach was elected by the Guardian as the uh, greediest uh, beach in the world. I would like you to decide if you agree or not with this decision. But it is a village really close to Santarém. Uh, it is uh, shown in this square in here and also close to Belterra where a historical site is still in there, the, the place where uh, Henry Ford tried uh, to build a, a rubber industry. Well, in this place, we have an example of um, a strongly biased sampling, which is what I'm going to call one of the Amazonian idiosyncrasies, okay? So let's take here an example. So this is the view of my old house and what you see here is Gabi. So Gabi is saying hi to you. And if you look at Gabi's back, you're gonna see here um, some really delicate pine, okay? If we zoom it, a bit, we're going to see this beautiful flower, which belongs to an endangered species of Bignoniaceae. And this is just in my backyard, and it's one of the commonest species in the village and also in the region in here, right? So uh, considering that a D2 uh, criteria was used to evaluate the species as endangered, um, improving uh, the uh, number of specimens available through collections uh, would probably take this out of the uh, status of endangered, right? Uh, and considering it is a really common species, I really think that uh, is supposed to happen in the next years. But why won't we don't have data, right? We have still uh, to consider it as endangered. So this is a, a really nice example of how biased is sampling in the Amazon. This is just my backyard, okay, guys? Okay, so this situation does not happen uh, punctually. It actually is quite common among a lot of species. So if you see here this graph that uh, was built by Hopkins in uh, 2019, you see that there's a lot of species that was monographed uh, that is just conceived by a really, really low number of specimens. And uh, we have 
only five species of the data set that Hopkins, Hopkins treated that has more than 10 spe uh, specimens to be analyzed in monograph. So uh, even if we know uh, uh, about the names and about the species itself, we have just a little material to deal with it and to take a decision on taxonomy and systematics and et cetera, okay? Okay, so let's go to a second uh, idiosyncrasy, uh, which is remoteness, I'll call this, okay? So this is an experience that I had in 2014. I was uh, working on a, a survey for a national park in here in Brazil, uh, Mapingari National Park. And we went to this really remote area, which was a white sand formation. It took us like two hours flying in an helicopter to get in there. And in here you can see uh, an image from above of our camping site where we went to collect. And I was really happy because in uh, this first experience that I have flying in an helicopter, well, this was the first reason that I was happy. I was flying in an helicopter for, for the first time. And the second reason was that I was really feeling that I was going to a remote place. Okay, so we went out of the helicopter, we settled up the campsite, and when I, when I entered in the forest, the very first thing I saw was a sova tree, a coma guianensis tree, which is part of the Apocinaceae, with a, a hole on it. And it was uh, being used to extract its lat uh, latex, which it, uh, it has uh, high value as a medicinal uh, plant, right? As a medicinal resource. And immediately I was a little bit disappointed that I was thinking I was in a really remote place, but virtually it made me felt that there's people everywhere in the Amazon. Although we see the places as really remote and really difficult to access, people are in there, right? And maybe we can count on them to help us diminish these gaps that we know that exists. Well, actually, uh, people all around the Amazon and their influence uh, in the uh, plant composition is well documented in the literature, right? So this paper that came out in Science in uh, uh, 2017 uh, denoted that there's a lot of uh, species that are useful and that are um, somewhat, their, their occurrence are favored by the uh, people that live in, in these sites. And you can see here in these two figures uh, from this paper that you have uh, uh, region is associated with uh, the uh, water courses, right, where they um, inhabit mostly. So it's more common to uh, for populations to inhabit this water course uh, sites. And uh, in these sites, they uh, highly influence uh, the species occurrences. Uh, some of these populations are not in the sites anymore. And nowadays, we just see the evidence that's, that the forest was um, um, somewhat um, cultivated by them, right? So the species composition is uh, somewhat uh, changed by them, okay? And what is interesting to see, if you, uh, if you see the whole basin as treated in here, you can see that there's records of these uh, planted forests everywhere in the basin. So they are uh, really well distributed along the basin although in, in different levels of modification, right? Uh, and this is just a little portion of the useful species, okay? So this is uh, 19 useful species that was considered in this study. But if you, we broaden this a bit, it can uh, change the picture. Okay, so another idiosyncrasy that occurs in the Amazon is that uh, when compared to other parts of Brazil, for example, the Amazon had a way uh, later colonization. I mean, in one sense, this is kind of good, right? Because we hope that the biome would be more preserved. And in fact, it is because of this. But thinking in the scientific perspective, we can see that uh, the botanical knowledge in the Amazon was delayed at least 50 or 60 years when compared to other regions of Brazil, where most of the botanical knowledge had its 50% built by 1841 with the Flora Brasiliensis. And in the Amazon, it 
was only reached by 1901. So this is data also from Mike Hopkins uh, from his 2019 paper. Okay. Uh, this is obviously an effect of uh, a low number of naturalists, uh, uh, difficult access, and also uh, little resources available in site. Right. I mean, in one hand, this is interesting because uh, less people, more preserved sites, but if we are really slow in describing the diversity and uh, the deforestation is advanced really quick, the uh, clock's ticking, right? So we have to uh, rush it up a bit. And actually, the clock is not just ticking, it's also melting, considering that the uh, temperature raising is really considerable in here, and it's really an, an important factor to the maintenance of the forest and of the plant diversity itself. A last idiosyncrasy that I would like to highlight is this lack of research interest, uh, infrastructure, right? So uh, to have an idea, I made some calculations this week for this talk based on the uh, public databases that we have, you know, uh, like GBIF and et cetera. And for the Amazon, we have a uh, uh, collection density of something about uh, 0.25 to 0.32 uh, exacates per square kilometer. And although we can't say pretty much what would be an ideal, uh, there's some estimates like the one for Campbell from 1989 that says that we have at least one collection per square kilometer in a tropical forest as a good measurement of collection. So uh, when you see these numbers, uh, you see that in general, there's a lot of collections missing in the Amazon. And infrastructure plus collections missing we have situations like this, uh, divergency in uh, the, num the number of trees that we actually uh, expect to occur in the Amazon. So uh, in the series of papers that we discuss the diversity of plant species and trees in the Amazon, we can see that uh, there's a really divergent number that was firstly presented by Terstige and his collaborators, right? And uh, later in 2017, uh, Cardoso, together with, with some of us that are here in the audience, estimated the number of trees uh, in a much lower um, number. And this is still being discussed, mostly because Terstige and collaborators deal a lot with uh, uh, plot data, which doesn't always have a voucher, right? And in the work of Cardoso, we tried to uh, use a verified uh, species list based on vouchers that are deposited in collections, right? So this is a reproducibility that there is somewhat wanted in, in uh, plant biology in general. Okay, so uh, consider what I've shown so far, and if we uh, could try to paint a big picture to, ta uh, to tackle down the problem locally, because uh, we can never work globally. Okay. Uh, what do we have in, in, in sense of, of the data presented? We have two kinds of shortfalls that should be tackled really fast, consider, considering the advance of the deforestation frontiers. Right? So uh, uh, one that is shown since the 90s is the uh, so-called Wallinson shortfalls, which is the lack of collections, right? So uh, we have really biased collections and no distributions. Right? And to tackle all this problem, some uh, of the things we can do is just collect, collect, and collect, deposit uh, collections in uh, Iberia and make them available. But one important thing as well is to train collectors right, to know how to proceed and work with local people. And why it's so important to work with local people? I really want to emphasize this here because uh, it will be my uh, next rationale after this slide. Some of the places that I'm showing and that I show you, uh, they are really remote and really hard to access. But uh, unlike we previously thought, they're not empty. There's people everywhere, right? So if we work with local people, there's a huge chance we can tackle these knowledge gaps without having to spend a lot of money renting an helicopter, for example, right? Another simple measurement that can be taken, it's just making data available. So since uh, we got in here in Santarém, which was six years ago, one of the first things we did 
is to digitize all the collections from the herbaria and uh, to try to uh, take high resolution pictures of them all. So uh, all the herbarium is digitized nowadays and it's an important local herbarium. We are now reaching 14,000 specimens and we are going to 50% uh, of images available. So this is a lot of resources for a fully known area. Remember we are in the, uh, just by one of the main gaps that I pointed you out in the first slides. Okay, so another shortfall that should be considered is what we call the linear shortfall, right? Which uh, one of the main consequences is the slower pace of discoveries and species descriptions and treatments, etc. right? Uh, this shortfall is a little more hard to tackle because we need to train uh, inside systematists and work with people abroad, but this is a higher uh, level education training, right? So it takes time, it takes money, and it takes interested people, right? So this is uh, really uh, defined in here, right? To make this fast a bit, one thing we can count on is try to train local people to help recognize rare and interesting species. They already know which species are uh, rare, right? They just don't know we are interested in them. So we can start a uh, dialogue and try to make this happen, okay? Uh, one of the things that is well documented in literature is that uh, to tackle these two shortfalls that I mentioned, we need funding, a lot of funding. And this, uh, there is strict relationship with uh, the funding availability and uh, the training of a botanist. But more important than that, uh, there's an even higher relationship among uh, the training of botanists and the numbers of, rock, of records available. So uh, what we could do to make this more effective is try to train botanists at, at a lower cost, which will have a huge consequence on, in the number of records available and therefore in uh, uh, Reduce, reducing the, the gaps I mentioned. So that being said, where the Solanaceae come in and where all the audience uh, that are here today listening to me is actually interested too. Okay, so I'll show you a study case now of how I uh, started to use Solanaceae to try to tackle these problems in a local scale and how uh, some of the tools I intended to use would actually be improved with time, okay? So everything I'll show you in the next slides basically started in a long-term ecological research site that we established in uh, 2016, and which is shown here in this map, which is marked in uh, the yellow uh, dotted line. Here's the website of our, our uh, long-term ecological research site if you, if you wanna check. And it's a pretty large long-term ecological research site. We have like 100 kilometers long per 30 kilometers wide site. And what is interesting is that we have two protected areas within it. One that is uh, somewhat uh, not strict protected area that allow people to live in. I mean, to build houses and et cetera, which is uh, the Área de Proteção Ambiental de Alterra do Chão. And the other one is a little bit more restricted, which only allows uh, local people to live it, like riverine populations and indigenous people to live in, which is the lower uh, protected area that is shown in this map. And this uh, red uh, uh, um, marks that you see in here is our uh, permanent plots, right? Where we monitor uh, animals and plants and etc. Okay. So one thing that we started in uh, these two protected areas is to try to gather our local students. So the students that are with us in the university, right? To train them how to proceed to collect and to identify plants and mostly to recognize plant morphology and to use this to influence the local people. So in here, you can see two of uh, the guys that work in Alterra do Chão as uh, tourist guides. Right, that take you to um, go around the freshwater uh, amazing beach that we have in there. And the idea was to try to train these students, we, which you can see some of them are related to uh, um, some indigenous um, 
ethnics. And uh, the idea was for them that live in there to start a training these local guys. This uh, project was running for a bit and we went out of money, we couldn't continue. And then later with the partnership with the New York Botanical Garden, Jardim Botanico do Rio de Janeiro, and the a funding from the uh, Moore Foundation, we could uh, start um, um, intermittent uh, initiative of training local people at uh, Floresta Nacional do Tapajós. So this is an image of a course that uh, we gave every two years. And the idea of this course it to, is to uh, introduce basic uh, uh, morphological concepts to local people and, and try to uh, exchange knowledge with them about how they recognize uh, the species and how we recognize the species, right? So we can uh, uh, get to the same point and, and have a conversation where everybody understands what's happening. And uh, this course is actually in the third edition now. We, we're going to the fourth edition. And we try to tackle every community at a time. So there's several communities inside the protected area. And we try to tackle uh, one of them at a time. But when we go to the sites close by uh, the places where we uh, administrate the courses, we mainly have huge trees where it's really not practical to uh, work on uh, plant characters, right? So uh, you can spend a whole day looking upwards, which won't be a comfortable day, or you can spend hours trying to climb it. This is one of the things we teach them. We teach them safe techniques to climb trees so can, uh, they can monitor some species in the future for several reasons, for getting seeds, for getting uh, non-timber forest products, or just to monitor some species for us in a research project, for example. So this is one of the initiatives that we carry out in here. We train collecting, uh, uh, climbing trees, we train pressing plants, and we do some basics on plant morphology. But with time, we definitely uh, concluded that wasn't really practical to work with the trees. Well, first because there's a lot of groups that don't have monographs. So it was really hard, even for us, uh, to get some correct names on it. Secondly, uh, most of the trees doesn't have flowers for years, right? So they don't see flowers. And sometimes this is not really a motivation. Okay. And then we started thinking that we could use Solanaceae as a model. And what are the reasons that we thought of that? Well, the basic one is that it's not a huge family. So you wouldn't have to deal with hundreds of species like Sapotaceae, uh, for example, or legumes, right? They're mostly herbs and shrubs or just small trees, so we don't have uh, to spend a lot of time climbing. And um, in the case of trees, they're mostly flowered year-round, like the Breventrum clade of Solanum. And we needed to, be, to build tools to give them so they could practice by themselves, right? So this was really nice reasons to start dealing with the Solanaceae. And the last one is that we just love it, right? We love, we love it, the Solanese. So uh, I think this is actually the main reason we, we chose it, okay? So to start, and with an important uh, starting point, we build local floras uh, to document, to properly identify the species and to, to get together all the specimens available for some protected areas. And in this process, uh, the local flora seem to me as a very important tool for uh, uh, undergrad resources training. So um, considering one of the protected areas that I mentioned that we have in our long-term ecological research site, uh, we build a treatment and a key that was actually a, a, a graduate, uh, an undergraduate conclusion monograph, monograph of one of my students, right? And uh, in this meantime, I tried to work on local floras where we have different kind of environments. So uh, in this example here in the left is a treatment of a protected area that is mainly forested. And this example here in the right is an example of um, mainly rocky outcrops formations. Right? And you can see that you have a feasible number of species for people to learn. So we have five genera, 19 species here at 
Floresta Nacional do Tapajós, and we have seven genera and 23 species at cada shot. Okay, with time, we figure out that interactive, cool, interactive tools were obviously more practical for these trainings. So we built a set of photographic guides. Some of them are just for internal use. Some of them we published, right? And while building these uh, interactive guides, we obviously came uh, into some Kulinon uh, species that we actually uh, concluded that is a uh, species and describe it to science, okay? So this beautiful Brunfelsia that you see in here is a species that we are in process of uh, describing it. And here is my student, Emily, with uh, one of the seedlings that we tried to cultivate to um, have an open flower and some fruits for a complete description. This is still in process. <laughs> it's a somewhat uh, huge plant and I think it will take a couple of years to have some flowers and some fruits. Uh, if you're interested, some of the guides are available at the Field Museum site, so you can download it. Uh, after we finished this smaller um, uh, initiatives, we thought, okay, we can now broaden the perspective a bit. And instead of uh, uh, being restricted to the protected areas in the right side of the Tapajós River, we uh, decided to move to all the lower basin and get at least three protected areas. So we would have more and more populations to work with. We would have a um, higher um, training level and more uh, uh, tools uh, to begin uh, working with. So um, this idea of broadening the perspective was, uh, available, was uh, possible through this partnership with the master students, Sonia Herrera, that you can see here holding a Brunfelsia Miri uh, at her hand. She was a master student of mine uh, through the Erasmus Mundus initiative in a partnership with the New York Botanical Garden. And the main um, goal of her thesis was to build an interactive key with a lot of characters that we considered that was really easy to see and to decide upon uh, for the local people. Obviously, these examples that, in the first, that are in the first slide in here, it's not super, super easy uh, aspects, but we have some that I'll show you in the next slide. So for the whole lower basin of the Tapajos, we could uh, list eight genera and 35 taxa of Solanaceae. And we worked in a huge matrix, but we really wanted a lot of characters, as much characters as possible to uh, make available to the local communities. And this uh, expert key is already published, so you can also access it through this website that is down here below. And here are some examples of uh, really easy uh, things that we thought we could use, like uh, simple measurements, like fruit diameter, the seed color, and the presence of prickles. And uh, they seem to work really well. I mean, the, with the experiences I, uh, we had with the local people, they seem to work really well. We built one of these uh, matrix in Portuguese and we got it printed to send it to, com to the communities. But nowadays, uh, the communities already have internet. So we are now working on a translation of this key to, to Portuguese so uh, they can use. Uh, we were actually thinking on translating it also to Spanish so it could be of a larger use. And if there's some, someone in the audience that is uh, interested in helping with that, I would really appreciate because I must confess that my Spanish is not the best one. Okay, so we started small, right, in two uh, tiny uh, protected areas. We moved to whole basing, right? Oops, sorry. And then we thought, okay, if we're moving fast like this, right, coming from one protected area to the whole lower basin, why can't we do into the whole Amazon basin, right? And then uh, Mauricio Silva, which is a master student at Instituto Nacional de Pesquisa da Amazonia, uh, uh, was actually very excited with this uh, project. And the idea of the master's uh, thesis of Mauricio was to build a database, uh, a really refined database with uh, a checklist and uh, specimens uh, base for all the Solanaceae of the Amazon. 
But differently from what we thought at the beginning, this was a really, really hard work. So the first time we tried to build some computers to download this, the specimens data, we came to almost uh, 100,000 records, 58 generic names, and 1,080, 85 species names. So it was a nightmare to clean this up, right? We really spent some time on this. This database was built in collaboration with Tina and Sandy through um, part of Solanese source that they kindly uh, allowed us to use. But we also uh, uh, tackled the smaller barium across the Amazon, mainly in Brazil and uh, uh, neighbor countries. So uh, whenever I could, I flew out to a smaller barium. I took photographs of all specimens and I tried to, uh, to determine them all. Okay, so Mauricio started this database in, in 2018, and he now has done some work in cleaning it. And the results that we have so far are way more beautiful than we had in the beginning, right? So we went from uh, 100,000 records to some 18,000 records. We now have 30 genera and 182 species for the whole Amazon basin, okay? Uh, and just to uh, show you how this was an expressive increase, in our review that was published in Cardoso in 2017, we listed 151 species, and we have at least 30 species more with Mauricio database and with the visits that we did to the smaller barrier and the hard work of identifying specimens. It was a lot of time that I spent on it. And there's still some work to be done. Uh, this was kind of interrupted because of the pandemics, right? So we're still thinking if we will be able to go back and finish or not. Let's see, Mauricio has some deadlines, but uh, we'll try to, to go that there be into that, that are missing. Anyways, we have a clean database right now for all the Amazon with 18,000 records, 30 genera, and this database will, will be made available soon through uh, the Solanaceae source webpage, right? So you can all use it. And I'll show you some previous results, some preliminary results. Here, the distribution of some genera, and you can see some points out of the Amazon. It's because uh, we wanted to leave all the points of this, the species that are actually Amazonian and uh, the points out of it to, uh, to check which, one, which ones are endemic. Okay, so this was important for us uh, in the beginning because Mauricio has also some uh, biogeographic questions that he wants to pose to his thesis. Okay, so if you check all these maps, I bet you can see, as I can, the same pattern that we see in the first slide where we talked about gaps, right? All the gaps lie in the same place, and this is not restricted uh, to... Uh, Inga or to Sapotaceae or the flora in general. This is also occurring in the Solanaceae. So we have the uh, upper uh, Rio Negro and uh, Rio Solimões where we have huge gaps, right? And obviously we see some uh, diversity patterns like Lysianthes is, uh, um, there's a lot of species in Acre state where we can see here in, in the border with Peru. Uh, Capsicum uh, is way more cultivated and uh, we can see way more exicates close to the more colonized areas. <coughs> Just a second. But anyway, the, the pattern is just the same for all, for all the, the data sets we have when we separate it uh, through gender, okay? The only one uh, where we see uh, not super scary pattern is Solanum but it's obviously a uh, way more collected group because first, because of the diversity and second, because of the species that occurred in um, uh, open areas and by the roads, right? So we have this situation. With the preliminary results that Mauricio uh, compiled, we can see that uh, these uh, number of species that we found in our protected areas and in which we did the floras they are actually what we expected to find in general. So uh, when we use a one degree square grid, 
we can find uh, the maximum of 25 species per site, okay? Just saying it again, we're still cleaning this, okay, guys? Especially in the names. So this is not final. This is just the preliminary results that I wanted to show with you. So uh, when we analyze by collection, some interesting results that we have is uh, like the one we, uh, I'm presenting here. So if we get the imperbarium as an example, in there we have uh, 2,521 specimens of Solanaceae. About 10% of them are not identified uh, to the species level. So they're only to the generic level. And that being said, I must say that I've been there sometimes. So I have spent some time in their dating material. Still, there are 105 uh, solanum section geminated specimens that are un unidentified and 76 uh, specimens of Cyphomandria that are unidentified. So with that in mind, I think you can guess what are my uh, future plans and my future plans for students, I mean, right? Uh, the problems we have to tackle in here are different, right? For both of these groups, we have monographs available. So for the geminated clade, we have a beautiful flora neotropica available. For uh, the siphomandria clade, we have a beautiful flora neotropica available. But in the siphomandria, the specimens that are indebted are mostly in fruit because of the key that are available, that is available. It's uh, mainly based on floral characters. So. One of the ideas that I'm uh, working on a new student and that are coming in in the next semester is to do some morphometrics and look for uh, um, uh, discrete, uh, sorry, continuous characters to try to separate species of the cyphromander clade uh, without having flowers, right? Whenever we, we, we have this kind of information, then we can try to solve these issues. Um, with the key we have available right now, it's not really practical to try to lower this number. Okay, some more results of Mauricio's thesis is to look in the distribution of the species that are endemic to the Amazon basin. And one very interesting species is uh, Duchiodendor cestroides, which has this crazy fruit that I show you. Here is the droop closed itself. And here is in a... Uh, halfway cut with the seeds being shown. And this is a bud here in the left. And one of the questions that uh, Mauricio was looking at is uh, to try to generate a GLM uh, to establish what environmental conditions uh, are in fact needed for the occurrence of Duchiodendron cestoides and all the endemics, in fact. I'm, I'm just showing one example in here, okay? So, but he's doing that for all the, for all the endemics. And what have we, we have found with the climatic variables and the uh, vegetation indexes, uh, when we run the Maxian algorithm and do a leave one out test, uh, we actually found that the climate and uh, the vegetation is not really important for the, for the distribution of the Chiodendron. So it predicted a way larger area than the known for the species. And the next step we should tackle in here, it's to investigate if the soil is an important factor. So climate does not seem to be a super, super important factor uh, when dealing with uh, Duchiodendron distribution, okay? The idea is to uh, get information on this, to think of uh, how can we uh, better uh, conserve this endemic species. Okay, so, I showed you some examples of um, dealing with tools to use with the local communities, um, uh, building a comprehensive data set so we can uh, improve the tools we use for the local communities. But we also have to have in mind that we have to keep the flow, right? So I won't be here forever. And I have to think that I need to uh, uh, train resources that will keep this initiative in the future, either with Solon AC or not. The fact that it's uh, the clock's ticking and we have to still uh, run to try to uh, diminish these gaps. And for high level training, especially on systematics, uh, I've been using the Breventerum and the Geminator clades 
and I will show you some results that we've achieved here in my lab and which will be, I bet, uh, of interest of, of some of you. Okay, so the preventum plate of solanum, which I, sh I show here in, in the red uh, arrow in the phylogeny of uh, Tina Sarkman and collaborators from uh, 2013, uh, was established uh, by Bose and Lizzie Bose in 2005 and 2007. And since the beginning, we uh, knew that there were at least five sections that were included in uh, the clade. One of the decisions that was uh, taken by Lynn when she named this clade officially in 2005 is that she decided to uh, include section gonadotrichum, uh, which is actually uh, super different from these other sections that, I, that is shown here in the upper part. So I'll jump here to the next slide. So uh, when Lynn decided to put the gonadotrichum together with these guys, what she was basically doing is grouping uh, entire lineage that has a whole set of uh, stelae trichomes together with herbs that only have um, this unbranched trichome with this special character of being uh, bent uh, down in a 20, uh, 90 degree angle, okay? Uh, when I try to investigate a bit the ontogeny of the trichomes, we see that in the base of the hairs, we have this multiple rays that seem to not develop. So this could be a stage of a stellate hair that is not fully developed, it's a possibility. Anyways, the morphology of these two groups that were united by Lin in 2005 in this clade, they're actually pretty uh, different from each other. Right? In 2015, when I was looking in some endemics from Brazil, I uh, complicated the picture a bit. And uh, just a second. And I also included the Inornatum species group, which is another one that has uh, herbs in a different habit and trichomes as a, a, a completing feature. So we can see that the group goes from trees, super high trees, to smaller herbs. Uh, Rocio, I just see that I, uh, I'm also almost reaching one hour in here, so I'll try to, to rush it up a bit so I can finish, okay? Okay, no problem. Uh, okay, so, I think I'm gonna jump a bit in these groups that I recognized, but uh, since I started working in the Breventrum clade, uh, one important result that we got is that we completed, completely revised the sectional uh, uh, level that was usually uh, dealt with in the clade, right? So most of the sections were not uh, recovered as monophyletic, and we actually established some clades. And now we are trying to tackle to uh, tackle down some of these clades for this higher level training that I mentioned before, okay? And one of these examples that was carried out by uh, Juan David that is shown here in this picture is um, the phylogenetics, phylogenetics of section Breventrum, which is one of the clades that is shown here is actually the Ariantum clade and the Abutiloides clade. And Juan investigated this group that has a huge distribution that, that goes way down from Argentina to uh, uh, Mexico and Southern uh, United States. It's a group of 31 species uh, and is mainly characterized by these large inflorescences, which are terminal and associated with these uh, uh, many rayed uh, stellate hairs. Well, uh, of the main conclusions that Juan got is that he found four clades within the previously established uh, section Breventrum. And this four clades was not congruent with the limits that we had before. So uh, based on the information that I gave you that the large inflorescence was an uh, important feature, one found that actually uh, one species, which is Solano inelegans, which has a lateral inflorescence and uh, a different dichotomy is actually part of the group. And some of the species previously treated as part of the group are actually not. So we have to uh, change these limits to accommodate it a bit. One also tried to uh, establish 
when the crown and uh, the uh, nodes uh, were uh, appeared, right? So he did this chronogram. I, I won't get in details because I'm running out of time. And based on his chronogram, he tried to build a set of events for the bio biogeography of the group. And he uh, actually found that there's a lot of uh, uh, long dispersal I events that occurred in the group. And this is shown by the uh, stochastic mapping that he uh, ran in his uh, thesis. Okay. Uh, dealing with trait shifts, just to finish, Juan found that most of the, the characters that was used to define the section, they're actually homoplasic. So you got to check this out and find uh, better characters to uh, define the section or the clades itself. And uh, I'm just showing it really fast in here, but this is a paper that are already submitted and might come out sometime soon. So you can all check the homoplasic characters. Okay, for uh, next steps and some future perspectives, uh, within this uh, huge phylogeny that I've built for the Breventerum clade, we've seen that the uh, information available in uh, the regions used to most solanum species, they were actually uh, way less informative in Breventerum than they were in the Leptestimonum clade, for example. So we decided that we should go for genomics to try to solve this clade. And now we are uh, working on a, a 353 bait set for the Breventerum itself. And Juan just uh, got into his PhD. He started the PhD a couple months ago, and he's going to do the same with the geminators. So please, all samples that you have, they are all welcome, and we will be happy to have them. Well, just to finish, uh, we cannot finish without going back to this question. So what the Solanaceae in the Amazon have in common? They are actually a really nice couple to enhance human resources training in an, in an area that uh, we urgently need that, okay? And some suggestions that I would like to give to you is please come help, up, help us fill the gaps. So uh, whenever you're interested uh, to try to see some Amazonian Solanaceae, come by, we can uh, do some field work together. And in the last uh, Congreso Latino Americano, I've spoken to some of you, to some of you, and we were thinking on an next Solanaceae meeting in Santarém. So let's keep this idea for after the pandemics, and this might work. Let's hope. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the attention. Uh, sorry for the uh, the time I took a little bit longer than expected. And if you want to chat, here's my email. Thanks, Sandy, Tina, and Lynn for all the data and for all the ideas you have been sharing. And if you have questions, I'm all ears. Thank you very much, Leandro. Very, very nice presentation, a lot of work. And yes, um, I think there are some questions if, if you want to, like there is a first question of Sandy. If you want to turn on your microphone and ask directly. Oh, Leandro, I just wondered if some of the difference between um, the numbers from Cardoso and the numbers from Mauricio is due to the different definition of the Amazon, because the picture you showed is the bigger Amazon. Right. But it can't, it can't all be that, but I just wondered if some of it was. No, Sandy, it's actually not, because I, I mean, the main difference between, between Tina and Mauricio is that we, with Mauricio, we kept the higher areas, the higher elevation areas. Yeah. There's no solar in there. So uh, the main difference is because we went to the smaller barrier and the, and the term mm -hmm. material. So that's the main difference. Now, super important. Thank you, Sandy. Um, yes, there are some comments. Um, yeah, so Franco, that he, he said that you should feel blessed that you can collect in the Amazon. It's like the dream of every botanist. Yeah, that's a dream. Imagine Thanks, that. Franco. You, and, and I just wanted to say that everybody's invited, okay, guys? We, we, as, you, as you saw, we need to collect. So everybody's invited to contribute. It would be super nice to have some of you guys here to go to the field together. And we can travel again. That would be super nice. Yes, <laughs> yeah. whenever we have this possibility. Yes, or having the meetings, the Solanese meetings there would be great, of course. So if, you, if there is any other question for Leandro, just 
soon on your mic. Oh, okay, Stacy. Mm -hmm. yes. So the color of the new Bunfelsia, the, the flower is yellow when uh, immature, then it turns to white. So it's actually yellow. It starts yellow, then goes, goes white. So that, this is why I'm saying it's uh, Affinis burkelli, but it's, there's a lot of different features among the uh, burkelli and the new species. Okay, that's super interesting. I'll be really excited when you get it described. Oh, nice. Yeah. And this is really easy to access. We can think of some pollination project on it because it's, it's really an, an easy area to access, which is crazy, right? The new species just waiting for us to be there. Is there, is there any other question for Leandro? Yes. Yeah, so Richard, yes. I also would have one, but I'm um, sorry, I've got a little muddled with my mic. Um, sorry, it's just um, uh, little household noises. I wanted to ask, based on what you're observing and how many unknown species there are in different genera in Solanaceae in Amazon, what would you expect to be the final size of Solana? Like how much more? You mean within the Amazon or in general? In general, but like from your you know. perspective of seeing how much more there is. Okay. Well, I, I don't like, well, um, are you hearing me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I don't expect to have a lot of new species of Solanum in the Amazon. So most of the new species that we've been um, tumbling on are not in Solanum actually. They're mostly Cestrum and Bufelsia and some different Schwenkias. And yeah, so I don't expect to have a lot of new species of Solanum in here. But in Brazil, I think we still, we still have 50 new species to describe. So let's just put another 50 in the count in there. And I, I think that's it. That's great, thanks. So yes, um, Richard was saying like, yes, it's a great idea to have a collection, collecting trip associated with a meeting of Solanaceae in Santarem, that would be great. <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, let's think of that, guys, whenever the pandemics allows us. Yes, it will be a great opportunity. And I am, yes, I, I found very interesting about the niche modeling about the Buchadendron that is pointing that um, it wouldn't be um, so much affected by the climate. And so you are uh, thinking about the soil or it could be something more uh, than that, like uh, some biological interaction, something more that could be affected the distribution of that species. It could be Rocio, it's hard to say because uh, the Cadendron is a very strange species, actually, because it has a very soft wood, but it's actually a really high tree. It, it can reach is up to 35 meters, so it's, it's quite high, but it has a really soft uh, wood. But uh, it's mainly found in, in sandy, sandy soils, so I, I would really expect it to be related with the soils. But nothing is known about pollination biology and, and dispersion. So we, we know nothing about it, right? But it's it's really related to the to, to the sandy soils. So we want to test we want to test that. Very interesting. And I don't know if I miss it or because you said that uh, you were doing these niche modelings for all the endemic species. Uh, how many endemic species are in the Amazon? Well, so far our, our database uh, we only have three. Mm -hmm. um, because we're working with, with a restrict uh, concept of endemicity. Uh, so we only have three endemics. It's a Joanuloa parviflora that is known only from the type. Um, I think there's a Lysianthes and, and Duqueodendro. So it's, it's only three so far. Thank you. Any last question for Leandro? Leandro, yes. Leandro, just one one question about Cestrum is why do you think that there are so many? Do you think people are just not describing 
because there's loads of new, you said there's loads of new, new sestrums. So is that because people aren't describing them or because they don't flower very often or are they, the, are they kind of super boring and people don't, I mean, not super boring, but you know what I mean? Is there kind of um, cryptic is people don't see them in the forest and so they don't collect them? Because yeah, vegetatively, I think... they look just, I mean, vegetatively, sestrums are so nondescript. Yeah, that's the thing, Sandy. So like, for example, Cestrum obovatum, which is a quite common species in here. It's one of the commonest, I think. Yeah. I think it's, it's just a, a bag of species. I think whoever goes for it and, and do some morphometrics and try mm -hmm. to... So I think it's just a bag of species. Well, yeah, like those two that I, those two that I sent you, the pictures of, the types of those. Right, yeah. And I mean, they kind of... Spruce, I don't know. Right? I mean... But that... Oh, that's one. Oh, I forgot, Rocio. So Cestrum spruce is also endemic. It's also an, an endemic, Sandy. So there's also Cestrum. But it's known only from the type, right? So it's just... Yeah. It's just too little information. We, we got to go to the field. But th those are... Are they mostly those um, those um, uh, uh, green-flowered, white-flowered Cestrums? They're the, they're the really... Because they're yeah. hard to find, even when they're in flower, it's they're really hard to find. They're hard to find, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so Obobatum, cool. Obobatum for example, has white flowers, white flowers mm -hmm. and purple fruits, yeah. Mm. And I mean, when you go to the herbarium, there's a lot of specimens, like at Impa, for example, there's like 50 specimens of Obobatum. But I don't see it in the field really often. It's not mm. really common in the field. Yeah. So are Selenum's common in the field? Some quinidum is really common. Some brevanterums like like asperum, like yeah. uh, rugosum. No, I'm just wondering because because you know the Andes, you can't you can't stop the car without finding a solanaceae. I mean, you just can't go anywhere without finding solanaceae. But in Africa and Asia, they're really hard to find. Super yeah. hard to find. So it's interesting that the Amazon is a bit more like Africa and Asia with respect to that. Yeah, no, it's not it's not that easy to find. I mean, Celeste mm -hmm. is everywhere, but besides that, uh, one, one, one interesting species is Marquea coccinea, right? Because it's mm -hmm. really common, but you only see it when there's flowers in the floor, right? It's really hard to see it, super, super hard to mm -hmm. see it. But it's really common. It's, I think we cool. have like 100 specimens in Edimpa. It's super common. Wow. Well, it's pretty. <laughs> it's super pretty, yeah. Is the Amazon also the only environment where you find ant associations in Solanesi or are they in other environments too? This could be completely a naive question, but just out of interest. They're in Central America as well. But um, I mean lowland wet forest, in other words, lowland wet forest, but restricted to New World or? To South America, at least. Well, because they're in Panama as well. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting, Tina, that you mentioned that, that I think I showed a picture of, of Schlechtendalianum with a lot of ants in the fruits. Mm. And I don't know what exactly they're doing in that. But yeah. when I see Schlechtendalianum in the Andes, for example, I never see ants on it. Ah, I've seen is it riparium in the Andes, in dry forest, in northern Peru. You see a lot of ants, but again, it's not yeah, the type of an association of a structure of the plant. It's... Yeah. And, no, so it hasn't got, it's not like an ant plant, like an ant yes. garden plant. Like Marqueas can be. No, it's not. No. Well, Hoxiophyton. Hoxiophyton is for sure one. And that's oh, yeah, yeah. middle, that's totally middle elevation in Panama. So not just the Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And here it seems that Schlechtendaliano has this relationship with the ants, like they kind of protect the plant, you know, so whenever you touch the plant, it just. Yeah, that's true. Selena malati, the one that I described from the Marañón, is like that. And I think that there's so Greg Anderson wrote a really cool paper a while ago, and Chris, you'll probably remember this, is is about these extra floral nectaries that are not, they're just kind of like patches where sugar oozes out. And you can actually, and you see them super, super easily when you grow things in a greenhouse, because where there aren't any ants, and in Lazia Carpa is full of them. You know, the calyces mm -hmm. are kind of these glistening sugar dots all over the calyx. Yeah, I but think when, it's the but same. But when, when they're in the field, the you don't notice it because they're always cleaned out by the ants the whole time. But Greg wrote a paper about that. I can't remember when that was, Chris. It was, it was like the 80s sometime, I think, or the early 90s. But anyway, it was cool. And it's real common, I think. There's another group, they are doing research on it now in Northeast Brazil uh, on these kind of, um, um, uh, extra floral nectary types like glandular uh, ex, ex, 
excreting surfaces and they have a solanum species and measuring it. I mm, heard. So cool. there may be more papers on it, but I'll let, let you peeps know if they do publish on it. Nice. That's nice. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Leandro, for this uh, great talk. Um, so we are finishing now the seminar and we are meeting next Friday, November 6th, um, that uh, Lynn Bolt is going to present some recent, uh, some updates on recent and current projects of a spicy solanacy. So see you next Friday. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for seeing you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. thank you, Leandro. Great seminar. Thanks, Sandy.